Hi, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And today, it's going to be a lot about innovation and some politics. And I'm proud to introduce my guest, uh, Pamela Ronald. She is a professor at, in the Genome Center and in the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of California, Davis. Uh, Dr. Ronald, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Um, now, I didn't warn you, we just chatted a few minutes before we started the, the recording here uh, that I have guests introduce themselves. So now I'm putting you on the spot. So you have 30, 45 seconds. You're in a room. You don't know anyone there. Go ahead. Tell us who you are. I'm a rice geneticist at the University of California, Davis, and I study how plants uh, resist infectious disease and also um, what are the mechanisms for tolerance to environmental stress, such as, as flooding. And I'm co-author of a book with my husband, who's an organic farmer, called Tomorrow's Table, um, Organic oh, Farming wow. Genetics in the Future. Of Hold it up. You've got a copy there. I didn't okay, have a copy there here. We there go. it is, Tomorrow's Table. If you've written that, Organic Farming Genetics and the, what, I'm sorry, what was the last Future one? Future of Food. Future of Food. And that came out 2008, is that right? The first edition, and then the, the, the new edition is 2018, so a few couple years ago. Oh, okay, great. And, and well, then the first obvious question is, how is it to write a book with your husband? That's, uh... <laughs> oh, well, you have to be very polite. <laughs> you have to say, well, I really like that, except maybe you consider perhaps possibly Dear. changing that <laughs> sentence. Sweetie. Don't, don't change yeah. it unless you really want to. <laughs> Well, good. Well, I, I want to get I want to talk about rice. I want to talk about your work in in, in genetics. Um, and it's a, it's a subject about which I, I, you know, I'm just learning the barest minimum. But you don't like the term genetic genetically modified organism. Why not? And what's your preferred term? Well, the, the term GMO is so broad. Everything we eat is genetically modified in some manner except maybe on the Pacific coast, we have wild caught salmon, or perhaps you're out hunting mushrooms in the forest, but almost everything has been modified genetically by human beings. And so for that reason, the FDA uh, in the United States does not use the term because it's, it's not very accurate. And really the term means different things to different people. So some people, uh, use the term and they're maybe a little alarmed by it because GMO rhymes with UFO um, or uh, so I, I just prefer to talk about be more specific. So I, I talk about genetically improved crops, which can include many different approaches or genetically engineered crops, which specifically means um, taking a gene from another species and putting it into plants. So I'll probably use those terms uh, during this interview. So genetically improved crops, and then what was the other one? I'm sorry. Genetically engineered crops. Gen okay, uh, there you go. Gotcha. Often uh, means that you're able to take a gene, for example, from a bacteria, and then put it into a plant. And yeah. we could talk about later why or why not you might might want to consider doing that. And and uh, if I'm right, or I remember my briefings on this, the sub one gene was uh, genetically engineered. Is that right? Uh the sub one gene is a special case. Well, it's genetically improved, but it's not genetically engineered. It was not regulated. So we'll talk about sub okay. one, but that was developed through a modern genetic technique called marker assisted breeding. And it's putting a rice gene in a rice plant. So it's not regulated. Gotcha. Well, so I just want to back up because I want to give you your full due. I know you introduced yourself and, and, and well, you were wonderfully brief. You're also, I looked you up, you're a Fulbright, you won a Fulbright Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, you're a Breakthrough Fellow at Breakthrough Institute. Your TED Talk from 2015 has been viewed more than one by 1 1.8 million people. 2019, you're elected to the National Academy of Sciences. 2020, you're named uh, a, a World Agriculture Prize Laureate by the Global F Confederation of Higher Education Associations for Agricultural and Life Sciences. You were the first woman uh, work recognized with this reward. So you've been busy. <laughs> well, I, I've had a really nice career, a lot of support from uh, UC Davis and, of course, wonderful colleagues. Well, that's that's a very uh, 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 nice uh, uh, way to deflect the, uh, the 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 words. But let me let me back up. I know we're bouncing around here just at the beginning, but I want to 
one of the things that's around you now, you're in Davis, which is west of Sacramento. The Caldor fire is just east of Sacramento. Is that right? I mean, you're you're seeing the effects of this right now. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. We've had very severe fire seasons for the last few years. Last year, there were fires very near um, where I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And this year, um, the fires are near uh, South Lake Tahoe, which is another place dear to to our hearts. So it's it's very challenging. A lot of people have been evacuated. The fire is still 0% contained. Um, very, very difficult situation. We're in, we're in Davis, which is in the Central Valley of California, very, very low um, fire risk here. So we're not personally threatened. Gotcha. You mentioned areas that you're, you're a California girl. That's where you grew up and raised. You went to school, I guess, at pretty much your whole, your all your academic career was in California as well. No, I went to college in Portland, Oregon, and oh, okay. um, I spent some time uh, in Europe and in Ithaca, New York. Oh, oh, right. At, at Cornell. Um so let's talk about before we started recording, and I, we're going to get to agriculture, but we, you talked about the evolution of pathogens, and you're a plant pathologist. And, um, and, and specifically, I think this is interesting now, and you couched it in the terms of the Delta variant with COVID. So talk about that, if you don't mind, about the evolution of pathogens, because uh, as the way I heard you explain it, I'm going to read it back to you, that this is something you have to do continue, continuously in agriculture and in public health is that this monitoring of pathogens because they're always evolving to, to hurt us again in some other way or this, is that a fair way to characterize it? How, do, how would you characterize it? Yeah, that's a great way to, to explain it. And it's something that really captured my imagination many years ago when I was an undergraduate, the fact that most plants are resistant to, to most microorganisms, but some plants are able to form a symbiotic relationship or a beneficial relationship. And then some plants are completely susceptible to very serious um, uh, diseases caused by bacteria, viruses, or, or fungi, for example. So uh, with the Delta variant, I think the, the public is, is becoming very cognizant of this idea that, that pathogens evolve and they evolve often to become more virulent. And certainly that's serious situation for human health, uh, but it's also a very serious situation in agricultural systems. So pathogens are able to evolve. You might have a crop that is, is growing very well, and then in a year or two, perhaps it succumbs to an infectious disease. And so uh, this is obviously important to farmers because if the, the crop doesn't have genetic resistance, then they have to spray often chemicals, sometimes um, not so healthy chemicals. So what scientists are trying to do is to understand that molecular interaction. Why are some plants resistant? Um, what is going on with the pathogen? And how can we take that knowledge and um, use genetics to uh, genetically improve crops so that they have resistance to uh, current strains and possibly emerging strains? And so this is something to, to and, and obviously now that's what we're dealing with, the Delta variant and looking at another round of vaccinations, inoculations to uh, stave this one off. But let's move it now and, and move to your field in, in plant pathology. What I, I thought in advance of our discussion and, uh, 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 you know, the big questions you've been I've, I've seen you interviewed many times about what you do and so on. But well, let me ask you a broad question about what are the biggest challenges in agriculture today? I mean, what I've seen, I was just noticing that we, we continue to see record harvests. In fact, the latest crop, latest news about record harvests in several East Coast states and in, in, in wheat and corn, et cetera, that it, despite a lot of predictions about uh, inability going back to Malthus to feed ourselves, that we're actually doing pretty good on that on that count. So, what what are, when you look at the future and you look at these issues all the time, what are the what are the things that would worry you about the future of agriculture? Well, the, there will always be some places and some uh, crops in the world with record harvest because the world is large, the crops are different, but there will also be some crops in some parts of the world that are um, just lost. And we, we see that a lot, especially in the developing world where we don't have access to um, chemicals to control pests, where we're not able to control water um, as well as we can in some, in some places. 
And so an example is the fall armyworm. It's a pest that was discovered several years ago in, I think, um, Ethiopia. And within just a few years, that pest has moved across the, the entire African continent. And farmers are really suffering. They're seeing dramatic damage to their corn crop. Um, and corn is a staple food for uh, many people in, in Africa. And the and, and the it's called. I'm sorry. It's called the fault armyworm. Fall armyworm. Fall armyworm. Right. Yeah. So it's a it's a pest, an insect right. pest. Um, and so that's just an example of where um, you can see this this rapid spread of a very serious insect uh, or disease. And so then, uh, farmers and scientists are scrambling to develop crops that will withstand that uh, with withstand that pest. Uh, and with as the climate changes, uh, these types of invasions are expected to occur more often and and quite unpredictable because we haven't experienced this uh, warming climate uh, it, before. Um, so that's one example. Of course, the other example people are even more familiar with is heat and drought and flooding. And so again, like just to give you an example, I work on rice and in California, all the rice paddies are very well controlled in terms of the amount of water that is added because it's um, the, the fields are laser planed and you can sort of turn on the tap on one end and drain it on the other end. You can get exactly the level of water, but that is not the case in most of South and Southeast Asia where um, these are rain fed systems and there have been um, terrible floods over the last uh, three, four years, and they're predicted to occur with increasing frequency and intensity as the climate changes. Well, so let's talk about that. Since you mentioned rice and flooding, um, when I you know look at you, at your work and 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 in and in, uh, in, in agriculture and the work that you did with David McKill and and I guess uh, one other colleague whose name escaped me, uh, Kenan was that his name? Yeah, Kenong Shu. Kenong Shu. That the three of you, I guess, work together and the discovery of the sub one gene. Tell me about the sub one gene and why it matters. Yeah, so this was quite a large collaboration with even more people. Um, and it started already, you know, 50 years ago, probably, where scientists at the International Rice Research Institute were, were screening. So they have a very fantastic seed collection and the seed collection is wild species of rice and sort of locally adapted varieties of rice called land races it's huge diversity and that genetic diversity is very important because um, genes confer important traits one of the important traits is tolerance to flooding and the reason this has been of interest is because every year in south and southeast asia uh, four million tons of rice is, is lost to flooding, which is uh, enough to feed 30 million people. So this has been a, a very serious uh, challenge for a long time. And just to remind viewers that rice grows well in standing water, but if the plant is completely submerged, most rice varieties will die. So researchers, um, uh, at the International Rice Research Institute identified a variety of rice that was called flood resistant rice that had a really amazing property. It could withstand two weeks of flooding and then it would start to grow again as the flood subsided. So there was a lot of interest. Um, breeders had used conventional breeding techniques to try to bring this trade in from this ancient variety into modern varieties that are grown by farmers. Um, but the resulting varieties were rejected by the farmers because the many of the other traits changed. So for example, they might not have yielded as well. Maybe they didn't taste as well. Maybe they weren't adapted as well to the local environments. So my uh, colleague, Dave McKill, Kenong Shu and I um, decided to try to isolate the gene and we were able to do that. We used the genetic approach. And then we were able to engineer rice um, in the laboratory to show that that addition of a single gene can confer dramatic submergence tolerance. So whereas the control plants died after two weeks of flooding, our plants survived. 
And then, well, not only they, if I can if I can interrupt, yeah, yeah, not, yeah. not only did they thrive, but I, I watched your TED talk and you showed the time lapse video of the submerged rice versus the sub one gene rice. And I, I watched it and I wonder, I, I, the thought that came to my head, did you ever look at that and think this is almost magic? I mean, because to me, that's how it came off, right? That just, it's almost magic what you've done. Do you ever, have you ever looked back at it and think, man, this is really incredible? Because to me, as a complete novice to what your field of study is, I thought, wow, that is impressive. Well, yeah, thanks for saying that. I mean, I love that video. It was developed at the International Rice Research Institute, and it really shows the power of genetics or the magic of genetics, if you want to put it yeah, that way. It looks like look like magic to me. I mean, you, you, because you can see it in in this very short video over it was a time lapse of uh, several weeks, right? Just that that it was, uh, but the, the 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 disparity in the growth rate was just remarkable. It's remarkable, and I, I think it really explains to people why scientists are putting so much time into genetic research, because it's really, um, for many different challenges faced by farmers, a genetic approach is the most effective and environmentally uh, sustainable approach to solving a particular challenge. And, and I think that that type of video really drives it home to to an audience whereas if you're just talking about genes and acronyms such as sub one it's it's not as meaningful right and and you get into acronyms and you get into yields and oh well it's 3x or 4x but i mean some of the things that i've seen just lately and i i talked with our mutual friend matt winkler about this and and john intine and some other people i mean well, there was a there was a headline just uh uh in the genetic literacy project they had an article about a transgenic maize variety in Africa that showed a three times output or the, the, the productivity. I, I want to read this, just this first snippet. It says data from the third confined, confined field trial of the Tila maize project that is being carried out at the Institute for Agricultural Research. Samaru has shown that the variety produces nine tons per hectare as against three tons by the best producing maize variety in Nigeria. The variety is now being tried in, in, in Nigeria is resistant to stem borers, Stem borers and fall army worm and is also drought tolerant. I mean, it sounds almost too good to be true. I, I, I mean, just that you can you can get this incredible increase in yield and an, an, an increase in resistance to the, you just mentioned the fall army worm, I, which I didn't notice that one one pest there. But I mean, it's just, is, is that what we can expect now? Is this continuing improvement and these kinds of yield improvements? Is this gonna be common or is it already common? So just to put that in perspective, it was really about 100 years ago that scientists first were able to demonstrate that um, we can make specific genetic crosses between different varieties of plants. And in this case, you know, um, uh, corn or barley, and you could cross a resistant variety with a susceptible variety, and then the progeny would be resistant, right? So that really began this genetic improvement program, at least for disease resistance. And certainly um, long before that, um, Mendel showed that you can make dramatic changes in, in phenotypes or traits by making genetic crosses. So genetic improvement has been a staple for agriculture for, for many, many years. And what we're moving into now are additional tools. So marker assisted breeding which was used to develop the the sub one variety the submergence tolerant variety that you saw in the video that started to be developed maybe 10 or 15 years ago it's a very powerful approach to bring just the key gene into the variety of interests without bringing in a lot of um, traits that the farmer doesn't want to see right and then we have genetic engineering, which I briefly described, which is you can take a gene from any species, put it into a plant. For example, the BT gene, which is used by, um, it's a trait, uh, a product used by organic farmers to spray into crops to uh, limit insect spread. So that's a very uh, powerful approach um, to take the gene for that and put it into plants, which reduces application of chemicals and then we have genome editing, which is another new tool. So all of these kinds of tools are considered a part of genetic improvement. And genetic improvement also um, is um, 
includes hybridization, which has also been used for you know, over a hundred years. So these are all very important tools and we can, in some cases, expect huge yield increases. Um, I would and, say and those that, are- And, and, and why, <clears throat> now I'm, I think I could answer this myself, but why do those yield increases matter? Put it and tell me, what is that, why is that good? Well, in, in, in some places in the world, it determines whether your children can eat or not. Um, so for example, uh, rice in many parts of the world is a subsistence crop, which means that farmers only grow enough to feed themselves and their family. And so if they lose their, their rice crop because of a flood, they don't have any grain. So it's very different you know, in the United States. Uh, we're in a, a market driven system. There's a lot of food around. Uh, we buy, we essentially are gonna buy our food. Um, and if, if obviously if we can't get it locally, which we cannot in many places in, in, our, in our country, we can buy it and we can buy it on the market and there's global trade. So, but if you're a subsistence farmer, you're not part of that uh, trade. Often you don't have much money to buy anything. And so that's why. So it could be the difference between starving and living. I mean, uh, yeah. to, to put it in, in stark terms, right? Yeah. So that's why it matters for many places in the world. But even for us, <laughs> it, it matters a lot because if you have a higher yielding crop, the farmer is using um, less fertilizer, uh, less pesticides, less water, which is huge. And um, there's less greenhouse gas emissions because the tractor is not going back and forth over the field so much. So this idea of um, high yield or productive productivity is very important for um, the, the environmental considerations. Well, and then the, <clears throat> the obvious one, I guess I'd add, is just you know, a smaller land footprint. And Jesse Osabel, of course, has talked about this. Other, other analysts, I think Ender Golkani had done some calculations that if if agricultural productivity had been stuck in where it was in, say, 1950 or 1960, we would need continent-sized farms to feed the world. And instead, <clears throat> as I recall, our, our, our agricultural footprint has been pretty flat for decades in the United States. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I think that's a really good way to talk about it is, is just the agricultural footprint. And we don't actually globally have that much arable land to farm that's left to farm. So we have to feed more people uh, with about the same amount of land and less fresh water. And there's forward. only, and, and, and is it then fair to say that the only way we're gonna do that, and I'm asking a plant geneticist, but is it through genetics? Is that the, that it really is, seems like it's the most powerful tool then that we have in the toolbox. Is that is that a fair assessment? Well, genetics has always been a powerful tool and it will absolutely continue to be a powerful tool, one of the most powerful tools. But of course, there's other aspects of farming um, outside of the seed. Um, so here in California, we've moved to drip irrigation as a invention in Israel. So we're able to conserve water um, more effectively. Uh, farmers are able to rotate their crops. So uh, that can reduce at least somewhat the amount of nitrogen fertilizers that need to be applied to the land. So there are quite a number of farming practices that are also important, but it's that combination of farming practices and genetically improved seed that really gives um, the, the higher yield with reduced chemicals with a, a smaller environmental footprint. Well, so let's follow up on that because one of the the uh, acronyms in your business is CRISPR, and I looked it up: clusters of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. So I'm a you know I'm a writer. Palindromes, I think of Bob and Radar, and you know, well, the obvious ones, right? But w what in looking that up, and I, and there was a, a a good summary summary of it on the Alliance for Science that there was a possibility that CRISPR this this it, which is a, a a method of editing genes. Have I got this right? Yeah. That you could potentially use CRISPR to help fix nitrogen in the soil, which could alleviate the need or reduce the need for synthetic nitrogen made with the Haber-Bosch process and natural gas. I mean, that seems to me to be almost too good to be true. Is there is there real potential there on the using CRISPR? Because it's, this is a fair is this a fairly new technology? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely a potential. So CRISPR is, is a tool, another tool in genetics that scientists are applying to many different um, problems and challenges. And 
course, one of the great challenges is that we're applying so much fertilizer, which has some very um, difficult environmental um, effects. So scientists are using CRISPR to try to edit um, the plant genome. And one of the ideas is, well, can we edit um, uh, receptors that uptake nitrate, so make them more efficient? Uh, so that is certainly one of the approaches. As, as, as far as I know, there's nothing that's been commercialized yet. There's, there's several labs that are, are working on that. And there is certainly a lot of potential there. And is CRISPR, is, my impression is that that in, among all the different tools in genetic management, genetic engineering, crop engineering, that this is a, a fairly new? Is that, is that, is that, is, am I wrong there? I'm, I'm betraying my ignorance here, but my ignorance on this is wide and deep. Tell me about the history of CRISPR. Sure. Well, just to put in perspective again, genetic engineering has been used in the field for about 30 years. So it's sort of an older um, technique. It's used in, in many industries, taking a gene from one species, putting it into another species. Um, CRISPR was, um, discovered by many teams of scientists, different aspects of it, but a very seminal paper was in 2012, which is not that long ago. And that was Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, who were able to show that they could engineer this CRISPR system um, to, to target specific DNA sequences. And so that paper was, was very important. So they were awarded the Nobel Prize last year for that work. And that's been, um, that was super important. Since that time, CRISPR, this idea of precisely editing a genome has been applied uh, using virtually any uh, species uh, that, ha that has been tried, tried on. And so it's, it's very powerful. And then for somebody that's a, a film editor or a journalist, the easiest way to think about it is you have um, your Word document, you have a bunch of letters, and you can just go in and you can delete certain letters, you can insert letters, and so you can really just type in um, the changes that, that you want to make. Well, so I mentioned nitrogen fixation because I'm, I'm familiar with the Haber-Bosch process, the artificial, I mean, before uh, farmers had to find guano, right? Bat guano or, or bird guano, that that was the key fertilizer and there was a big global trade in, in guano. But Haber Bosch, Haber Bosch figured out how to manufacture synthetic ammonia from from natural gas, and it fundamentally changed agriculture. Is there is there in using CRISPR? Is there one? Is there a holy grail in that regard besides nitrogen fixation that would be an objective that uh, that genetic you know genetic engineering would be aiming for, or is it just all going to be depending on the different crop that you're talking about? It so it depends on different crops. So so. Nitrogen fixation is a little bit different than nitrogen uptake. Okay. Um, but both are equally important. Both have the same effect of reducing <clears throat> nitrogen fertilizers. Nitrogen fixation is a very interesting and important process. And it's, it's a relationship between a plant and a microbe that's able to take nitrogen from the air and fix it in a manner that the plant can, can take up. And those plants are sort of what we consider broadleaf plants like soybeans, um, for example, yeah. fixed nitrogen. Right, but, le le uh, legu legumes, right? That, that's, yes, yeah. okay. exactly. But we have uh, many important staple food crops, such as wheat, uh, rice, corn, that do not fix nitrogen. So that has been really a big effort and interest since I was a young graduate student to see if we can get these plants, our cereal crops, to fix nitrogen. And there's still a very, you know, very talented teams working on this. It's still, I, I think I'm gonna say a moonshot because you not only have to modify one gene, but you need to modify the whole physiology um, to allow plants to form that um, symbiotic association with, with a, a bacteria. So it, it's, it's very important, um, but I think there's sort of lower hanging fruit that people are using CRISPR for and we already have examples where CRISPR has been used to engineer plants for resistance um, to pathogens, diseases. And um, we have some interesting types of um, approaches uh, that, are, that are, are, are coming up. So traditionally with, with crop improvement, we take a crop that has been domesticated for maybe 10,000 years. So rice has been domesticated, meaning humans have uh, 
intervened sure. in that crop for 10,000 years to make um, better grain, better so, taste. So we're really talking about the cereals, wheat, wheat, corn, and rice. Is that, yeah, yeah okay. But virtually all the crops we eat have been okay. domesticated. Sure. Um, and so that's very nice for the farmer and the consumer because they have large grain and easy to harvest and they taste well. But during that long domestication, we've lost some genes for resistance or environmental stress tolerance. Um, and so the, the breeding approach is to try to bring those genes back in. So like the sub one, we went into a gene bank, we found an interesting gene and we try to bring it back in to the modern varieties. But there's another approach, which is to take uh, plants that have never been domesticated. So they might be very um, resilient to environmental stress but they're not producing a very good good grain or they don't taste very well. Mm. So scientists are now trying to use CRISPR to just go into that wild species or a crop that's really never been cultivated and try to use CRISPR to change, for example, the fruit size, the flavor, the color, the grain yield. And so it's, it's a different approach um, to developing crops. And um, it, it, that's also quite exciting. So these are kind of two different. I see. So, it, but CRISPR could also be used in terms of spoilage, right? I mean, I think you mentioned this in one of your that you could make your tomatoes or your corn or something that would be fresher longer. Is that would that be something you'd use CRISPR for, or would it be a different technique? Yeah, you could probably use CRISPR for that. You know, sort of a a famous uh, example for non spoilage was the flavor saver tomato that was um, developed in Davis, California, uh -huh. and it never really took off uh, uh -huh. it was the flavor apparently wasn't very good to, to start with um but you know that, that... So, you had a, so you had a lousy tasting tomato that's <laughs> lasted longer on the shelf oh exactly. great this is that's it sort... this is science at its best yeah this, <laughs> that's that funny. project was kind of abandoned but certainly um you know there is a reason for slowing down ripening so if you think about mangoes um, it's nice to be able to ship them far. If you're in some places in the world, there's mangoes everywhere and they're they're ripening too fast. So if you can slow down the ripening, you know, maybe it provides some sort of economic um, stability for a poor mango farmer if they can, you know, ship it to a further place. But But that's just sort of genetics in general. So I think you can do that with genetic engineering or breeding or CRISPR. So that 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 type of ripening alterations can be addressed by by different genetic techniques as well as handling techniques right because if you know you put your avocados and bananas together they ripen faster right. uh so if you don't want them to ripen you keep you keep them separate so there, is, there that, is that true putting avocados and your bananas together they ripen faster oh yeah I give it a try know. okay well you I'm, can do I'm, your own experiment my 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 bananas generally go bad before I'm able to eat them, so I don't know the. Uh, um, they produce a gas called ethylene, which affects the the fruit next to them. Ah, well, uh, huh? Ethylene comes out of petroleum. I didn't know they were produced ethylene. Is that right? Wow. That's produce ethylene. Huh. Okay. Very well. potent hormone. Ah. Okay. Um, well, so what is, I mean, I asked you about this before and you, well, actually one other question, you, in, in your Ted talk, you talked about the, the, uh, the plant teosinte, which is the, the precursor of corn. Um, and that, that, that corn maybe is, is corn, well, I'll pair, I'll, I'll just ask the question. Is that the best example of, of overall uh, now centuries of humans m m monkeying with, messing with, and modifying grain is that the the quintessential example of of cereal grain that humans have been perfecting over time because you showed the teosinte which you as you said wasn't didn't taste very good that it was hard to shuck it was hard to produce that now we have this incredible corn is that is that the best example of how humans have made cereal grains better over time do you think well it's a great example it's a very visual example i mean it's really true for for everything we eat that there has been this dramatic change and if we look at the ancestor or the progenitor 10,000 years ago, you know, modern day people wouldn't really want to eat it. Um, but what our ancestors did is they started to uh, plant and harvest, and then they started uh, carrying out what we consider primitive domestication, just picking 
the progeny and replanting the seed for those that have useful traits. And so the, the nice thing about Teosinte is you have um, this very low producing type of, of grain that you have to break open with a hammer. And so, it, it, and now we have about a hundred fold higher productivity uh, from a single plant than we did 10,000 years ago. And, and well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was one of the points you made in your TED talk, which a hundred fold, I mean, that's just a staggering increase, but it didn't, it didn't happen overnight. We're, I mean, this is a centuries long process of increasing yield and so on. Um, let me ask you, this is another sophomore question, which are maybe all I have for you today, but how, you, so you got sub, you, you figured out the sub one gene and you, you produced this one patch of rice that did incredibly well, which I'm assuming exceeded, well, maybe exceeded your own expectations. How do you propagate the seed? Because now how many farmers are using the sub one, the sub one rice? How many are using it now? Several millions, right? Yeah. A couple of years ago, it was 6 million. I'm not sure how many last year, but maybe up to 10 million now. Wow. So uh, how do you propagate the seed? You just have one field and you just, you, you harvest all that seed and then plant another one and harvest the seed from that. I'm, I'm uh, again, I'm, you know, it's a simple question, but I'm a simple guy. How does that work? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And, and that is pretty much the answer. Um, and this took again, international collaboration and a lot of infrastructure. So um, we have international centers in Bangladesh and in India in um, the Philippines. Well, I should say in the Philippines is the international center. And then they work with the national programs in Bangladesh and India, which are national breeding programs. And they work very closely together. And um, scientists at the International Rice Research Institute have developed a network of collaborations uh, over many years. And so when um, the, the team at the International Rice Research Institute developed these varieties, through marker-assisted breeding. They then um, brought those seeds to their collaborators in India and Bangladesh. And those scientists in those breeding stations would grow the seed and then they would test the seed in those environments to be sure that they see. are right. performing yeah. um, as needed in those locally adapted environments. And then once the Bangladeshi scientists said, yes, this, you know, this is good, our farmers are gonna want that, then they need to bulk up the seed. And it's exactly like you say, they, they plant the plant and then they harvest the seed. So as you can imagine, if you have 6 million farmers that, that need the seed, how does that happen? Well, it happens in several ways. One is that it's um, bulked up in those breeding stations and then provided to local farmers um, through just their, their normal, normal costs, which is usually very, very minimal. And um, the Gates Foundation actually uh, helped support that uh, what we consider bulking up the seed process, which was you know really important, I think, to have that financial help and to pay the and, salaries. And that's what it's and that's what it's called bulking up the seed. Is that the is that's a term up. of art? Uh, yeah. And so, so then from from, from and, and just to interrupt, uh, is, so from the time when you did the test to the time that you get to six million, how many years are in that in that interval then? So we isolated the, the paper describing isolation of the gene was already um, several years ago, 2006, I think. But prior to isolation of the gene, um, my colleague Dave McKill, who had moved back to the Philippines, began his marker assisted breeding process. So the isolation and gene cloning in my lab was being carried out in parallel with the breeding efforts um, in, his, in his lab. And so by the time we had published the gene sequence and just not too much technicalities, but after you have the sequence, you can develop um, markers that, that enhance the breeding process, make it go very much quicker. So you can produce um, the seed more quickly. You, you, yeah, you can produce, first you can produce a variety because you don't only want one variety. You want to put this gene into different varieties. Oh, I see. Bangladeshi right. okay. farmers want vari one variety. Indian farmers might want another variety. So that process of, of bringing in the gene called marker-assisted breeding uh, really relies on these markers, these genetic markers. But once you have that variety, then 
comes this bulking up process. So you only need really one seed and then each plant produces 500 seed, a thousand seed. And so then you can keep self pollinating. So at that point, it's all self pollination. So that can occur in these breeding stations. And then they give the bags of seed to the farmers. And then the farmers can grow the crop. They can eat some of the seed and then they can self pollinate some other seed. I and see. then they have their own seed for the next year or they can give it to neighbors or they can sell it to their neighbors, which when we visited down there, we found out was also very common. Right. So you're, you're talking about in that bulking up process from the lab in 2006 or whatever to get to five or six million farmers, you're talking five, six, seven years, 10 years, something like that to make that, to scale it up because that's always the challenge in any new technology is from the lab to, to, to scale, right? It's the same in the energy business, but is that, is that fair? Is that about, I mean, to, from, from yeah. your, from your first paper to getting it out to millions, that's, that's a, a years long process. Yeah. And the scaling up was really made possible because of many 50 years of collaboration between these institutions. So they already had the infrastructure in place. They had, they knew which varieties they wanted to put the gene into. They knew how to do that. And so, um, we really can't, I just really want to emphasize that that type of um, breeding centers are, are, are just critical to this project. So my lab alone, well, we couldn't have done this project. So first of all, we didn't have the germplasm. I didn't have my collaborators. Um, and so we did sort of the, the, cent, the part in the middle, isolating the gene, characterizing the gene. Then I have a collaborator in the Riverside that figured out the physiology of how it functions. But really, I have to emphasize that the credit for getting it in the hands of farmers go is to the International Rice Research Institute, their scientists and their team and their collaborators in Bangladesh. Um, and so, India. I mean, what you're describing to me as I hear you say that is that a, a, a trust network that's been developed over years that was essential to make this all happen, right? That you knew you had some a counterpart that you knew they were capable, you knew they were trustworthy and that this was gonna make the whole, that, that it was this collaborative effort all toward a, a similar end, but it wasn't about necessarily about profit. It, were, it was about this trust network of, of making, well, and now I'm making the world better. Is that, <laughs> I don't mean to you know sound, uh, I don't even know how that sounds, but is that a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely. So rice, um, developing rice seed for subsistence farmers is not a for-profit endeavor. So the International Rice Research Institute is funded at one point entirely by nonprofit foundations, the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, for example, the Ford Foundation, I think was one of the early uh, contributors. And the goal of the International Rice Research Institute is to develop rice varieties for resource for poor farmers. Um, they don't, it, it's very different than what we see in the United States where we have seed companies that are selling seeds um, to farmers that can afford it um, to grow food that uh, is sold to consumers. So sure. the, it's a for-profit system, but it's very different um, in many places in the less developed world. And that's what, one reason I was interested in working on rice because it's a, a stable food crop for more than half the world's people and a, a huge need um, to continue to develop varieties that will um, enhance food security and environmental sustainability. So let's talk about, uh, well, I, I, what's golden rice and why is it important? So gold, So just to back up a little bit, another huge challenge. So we've talked about some of the challenges. We've talked about pests and disease. We've talked about environmental stress, but another challenge is, is nutrition. So there's some places in the world where children, um, primarily children and young mothers have vitamin A deficiency. Um, it's a very se severe deficiency. They often are eating rice three times a day. They don't have money to buy vegetables. They don't have a farm to grow the vegetables. So they're, they're buying food um, that has calories. Um, but the problem is that they're not getting uh, basic nutrients. So nutrient deficiencies remain a huge problem in many, many parts of the world. And their uh, vitamin A deficiency is estimated to affect uh, about, um, I think, 500,000 children every year. And many of these children will go blind and, and half the children will die. So this is 
just been a very serious problem that's been recognized for a very long time. And of course, there are many approaches to um, attacking vitamin A deficiency. There's things like supplements. So try to distribute the World Health Organization uh, distributes um, chemical supplements to um, uh, people uh, around the world, but often it doesn't reach these rural areas. There are farm programs to try to, uh, at least for on farm people to try to um, do grow different types of leafy greens and carrots. Um, but despite these efforts, there's still been this terrible toll. So this project, Golden Rice Project, was started um, already 25 years ago, perhaps, by supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. So again, this is in the nonprofit domain because it's not something you're going to make money on. So developing, right. uh, the goal is to develop rice that is biofortified. In other words, that it produces um, components that the human can metabolize to produce their own vitamin A. And it's been scientifically a very, very successful project. There has been a um, several rice varieties that have been developed that have high levels of vitamin A, uh, precursors to vitamin A, and um, are expected to save the lives of, of thousands of children every year. So the in the Philippines, the Philippines um, Biosafety Committee just approved um, commercialization uh, of golden rice just last month. So it's a very exciting time. So hopefully it'll be in the hands of Philippine farmers very soon. Um, but it's been a very long time. So, you know, there were scientific challenges, of course. Um, the first version had low amounts of beta carotene um, in the seed, which is a precursor for vitamin A. So it was developed to have higher levels, um, which has um, been confirmed to be high enough to really make a huge difference in saving lives. You know, there were, there were problems in, um, you know, developing the varieties, but a huge, one of the biggest challenges was there's a lot of people in the world that are against biotechnology and a lot of uh, protests and um, fear, I, I have to say fear mongering. And uh, so that's really slowed it down. I mean, I think everybody is aware of this kind of thing today. So we have vaccines, which are clearly saving the lives of people, but we still have many people around the world that hear that vaccines are harmful and they, they see these conspiracy theories. And so um, we haven't had as much uptake as we really need to, to um, keep our world safe. And I well, think you know, as, you, as you say that, I just uh, what pops into my head, and I hear you say that because we we talked about uh, the evolution of pathogens, and we talked about uh, the the genetically engineered organisms, and I see these opposition to vaccines, nuclear nuclear energy, um, you know, genetically engineered crops. They all seem to me to be of a piece in some kind of distrust of science, distrust of technology, distrust of of. I mean, frankly, people like you, or I mean, you know, the the, the man, right? The you know, big business that there's that based in these kind of crazy conspiracy theories, or this idea of we need to go back to nature, or somehow we've violated our covenant with with Mother Earth, or something. Does that make sense to you? I mean, is it, I'm just now thinking out loud about these, but I see it in those three fields: in energy, in in public health, in food. There's just kind of a similar kind of um, foolishness, as you say, fear mongering. Is it? Am I seeing this, or do you see it the same way, or if so, or differently, how do you see it? Well, absolutely. I think this is another huge challenge of our time, combating disinformation. And there's, you know, most of the people that are um, ill affected by these conspiracy theories are are, are well meaning, but they're getting they're you know, they go on, I don't know, Facebooks, or they the people come into their house and and scare them, and so. There's very innocent, vulnerable people that are that are affected, um, but there are um, a couple organizations that will provide disinformation on all these things at once. And you, you. So can I say can I say the word Greenpeace here? Or is this, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that they're involved in vaccines, but I know when it comes to nuclear and GMOs, they're they're in the, among the guilty. I try not to name names, but um, there are some organizations that will will say. 
vaccines and GMOs, they never really specify what they mean by GMOs, but just something scary. Vaccines and GMOs will, you know, cause infertility and they're pushed by big companies and, uh, you know, they're going to give you cancer, they're going to give you autism. It's really the same sort of talking points unrelated to any scientific basis that really scares people. Many of these groups are also selling something instead. And you'll, you'll, you can go on the website and there's supplement companies, don't take the vaccine, eat this that I'm gonna sell you. And, right. um, and it's, it's also not even necessarily directly selling something, but all the clicks. So it's, it's a very wear, emotional- wear, wear garlic around your neck or something. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, this is, I would say always been the case for human beings, this susceptibility to conspiracy theories. Um, and it will remain a challenge uh, our whole life um, about how to um, bring human beings back to the essential issues of public health um, importance and uh, you know environmental resilience and uh, thinking about uh, what farmers need to do to survive. So we're gonna be busy for a long time combating misinformation. Sure. Well, and this has been a theme I've talked about on the podcast a lot of time about the, you know, the, the uh, for, for many guests about the politicization, politicization of science, politicization of technology, how it's applied in terms of policy and, and so on. But let me step back for just a minute because I, I, we're coming on uh, close to an hour. And again, my guest um, is Pamela Ronald. She is a plant uh, pathologist and a professor at the, univer uh, at the University of California in the Genome Center and the Department of Plant Pathology and the co-author of uh, Tomorrow's Table with her husband, uh, Raul Adamchuk, who I br me briefly met in California a few weeks ago. Um, so uh, when talking about the Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug, of course, is held out as a, you know, a, a uh, one of the heroes of that effort. But in looking at some of the things you've said, you're, one of your heroes, I think, is Barbara McClintock, who was profiled in the book called uh, A Feeling for the Organism. I, I wasn't familiar with her. Tell me about Barbara McClintock and, and why, um, or, uh, I'm, I'm making a jump here, but I'm assuming you mentioned this book in an interview that I saw um, and that, that it quite affected you. Who was she and, and when, why was she important to you? Barbara McClintock is one of the most famous plant geneticists, and I think um, she uh, also, of course, is a, a prize winner, a Nobel Prize laureate, and um, I think her work resonated with me quite a bit because showing my age, I when I started my career, there were still many more men than women, and um, I was able to meet her. Uh, and her work was dismissed for many years. So she made a fundamental discovery um, that's relevant to all organisms that there are pieces of DNA that hop around in the genome. And until her discovery, it was thought that DNA is static. You can't have pieces moving around. And so she kept working um, and demonstrating this. And eventually her work was rediscovered in bacteria. And then at that point it was accepted. So this is just somebody that um, devoted her, her work to something very important, um, very serious scientists, very admired uh, by scientists around the world. And then of course there was a- But she, but she stuck with it. In she a, in stuck a, in, with it. In a, in a period that it was much more of a man's world then than even when you started going to school. I mean, is that a fair assessment? Oh, yeah. She couldn't even get a job as a professor. She had to sort of work in, you know, these sub subpar jobs. And um, eventually, happily, before she died, she was very well um, re respected. Um, but I think it also there was a book written by Evelyn Fox Keller called A Feeling for the Organism that I recommend that people read. And it was really exciting for me to read because I was a young scientist and, and uh, it really captures the excitement and the beauty of science and the thrill of discovery. And uh, so that book really resonated with me and also I think um, brought uh, new attention to the importance of Barbara McClintock's work. So is it fair to say she's one of your heroes? Yes, and sure. who, would, who else would be in that in that uh, locker room of, of of heroes in 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 your field or, or other fields? Well, I have um, probably many heroes. Uh, Jennifer Doudna, who was awarded the Nobel Prize, is a fantastic scientist. I've had the privilege of um, meeting with her, working with her a little bit. Um, 
really admire, of course, her, her discovery, which has changed all of biology, um, and really making an effort to communicate science and to consider um, the risks and consequences of the work. Um, and I have, um, you know, many scientists that have um, really inspired me uh, during my career, uh, supported me. I think science, uh, for any of you out there, is a fantastic profession. And it's a really su supportive network. Of we Science is challenging, so we need each other. And um, there's always somebody around to, to help you move forward. Um, so, well, that's, that's a good rundown. So um, uh, it, it, one of the things I have to ask you is, I know that, uh, and I mentioned I'm, uh, your husband, Raul Adam Chuck, who's your co-author with uh, 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 on the book, Tomorrow's Table. Um, and I know he's an organic farmer. Are you a gardener? If so, what do you grow in your at your house or your home? And, and what do you what do you grow? Or do you even have time for that? Oh, I should have brought the, I brought a basket to to the lab group today. We are growing a lot. Uh, so in the basket that I brought today are tomatoes and peppers and peaches and figs and apricots and eggplants oh, and oh, basil. Stop already I mean, now. I'm like... <laughs> July and August in the Central Valley of California is very abundant and it sort of um, makes up for the smoke that we have because the food, the plants are still producing, which is very uh, encouraging. Okay, so this is a garden. Well, okay, so is this the farm or is this the garden? I, maybe I'm trying to split, you know, maybe I'm getting too specific here, but uh, but uh, Raul manages the the organic farm at the university there, and that. but do you have a personal garden as well? Is I mean, how much do you, time do you spend in the, this tromping all, around this, in the dirt? This all came from our backyard. Oh, okay. A lot of credit goes to Raul, so he, uh, retired last year from his position at UC oh, okay. Davis. And so now we went through a period of four weeks where we had no vegetables and it was it was very tough for us, but he's now back uh, growing everything uh, in, in the backyard. Gotcha. Well, that, that sounds great. I, I, the, the idea of peaches right now sounds really good. Well, a couple of last last questions, and then I'll, uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll stop. But so, what are you reading now? I, I like to. I, you've got a shelf shelves full of books behind you. What uh, what's on your nightstand? Who who do you who, who do you read when you're not working, or is it all reading for work? <laughs> well, I've been reading some um, maybe a little. Uh, unusual books, but I read a book called Transit, which is about um, uh, refugees in Marseille in 1940, trying to get out of Europe. And now I'm reading another uh, book about the same time um, that also describes that period. And so I usually kind of go in deep to, to a certain area. Um, so my father uh, is a refugee, and and so that's that time and that place is is quite uh, interesting to me. So those are the books I'm reading right now. And, and from also, and from where did he come? Your dad? Uh, he's from Berlin, and uh -huh. then he he fled the Nazis uh, to Paris, and then southern France, and then Cuba, and then eventually made it to California. Wow, remarkable! And what year was that? Did he made it to California? After the war ended. Um, so he came in 46. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I mentioned, I, I, well, one of the other guests I had was uh, Peter Osnos, uh, his new book uh, that just came out uh, called A uh, uh, Remarkably Good, oh, dang me, I'm going to forget it right now. A Remarkably Good View, I think, uh, an especially good view, I think. But he tells the story of his parents um, fleeing Warsaw and they, he arrived or they arrived in, in California, I think, in 1946. So similar, uh, a, a, a similar experience, but harrowing. I mean, just in the remarkable story that he tells about his parents, especially his father. Um, well, so yeah, last quick. Go I ahead, think please. That really resonated with me and influenced me because, you know, I, I wanted to do something for the world. And uh, I, I understood at a young age that not everybody um, is able to have a house and a home and uh, a stable nation, which is the way I considered the United States, at least when I was growing up. Um, so that I think really gave me kind of a motivation and vision to work uh, in less developed countries on food. Well, that's interesting because I mean, in, in talking with Peter Osnos, he, he mentioned that similar kind of drive, just that there was something that had been inculcated in him from a very young age that he just he had it from the beginning, right? That he was going to make something 
and make it happen for himself, that he would just have this motivation. And it sounds, uh, well, obviously, given, you know, your your career and what you've been able to do, it's, uh, it's a similar, uh, somewhat similar in terms of the drive. Um, what gives you hope? Well, I think the fact that I was able to pick figs this morning um, was reassuring. The water <laughs> is still there. And um, uh, so so it gives me hope just sort of you know, basic kinds of processes like that. There are some things that are, are remaining um, the you same. Find, you, find, you find hope in the garden. Yeah. And I, I usually find hope up in the Sierra Nevada mountains, but uh, that is a little unstable right now because of the fires. Um, but of course, I find hope talking to people like you and my students. And um, there's so much exciting science that is happening. And I really, if I do get down, which does happen, um, reading the newspaper or looking at the smoke, I mean, I think in general, just the scientific process really gives me hope because we do we do make progress. We help each other. And I think it's, it's healthy for us to have um, something to work on, whether you're a filmmaker or a journalist or a scientist, or uh, just to be doing something that maybe you can't see at the moment is going to vastly change a particular challenge, but it is contributing to that end. And I think if we all continue to work, um, that, that is what we need to do. So I, that does give me hope, that process. Well, that's a good place to stop. So, um, this has been great. I was uh, pleased to, you know, bump into you again a few weeks ago and that we finally made this happen. And, uh, 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 you know, best of luck to you. I mean, it's a remarkable work that you're doing. So I, I you have a fan here. Um, my guest, uh, Pamela Ronald, she is a plant pathologist. She's a professor in the Genome Center and in the Department of Plant Pathology in, at the University of California, Davis. She's the co-author of Tomorrow's Table. She has a very popular TED Talk that you can, oh, it has been translated into 26 languages, I saw. Um, so uh, you, she's easy to find on the interweb. So I encourage you to look her up. Pam, many thanks for your time today on the Power Hungry Podcast. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Tune into the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. It's going to be just as good as this one, maybe, I hope. <laughs> Until then. Okay.